Mm -hmm. Before starting our presentation, we welcome everyone. First of all, we thank Lu Wang for accepting our invitation uh, to speak at our Congress. She is professor of geology in state key laboratory of geological processes and mineralogical researchers of China, University of Geoscience in Wuhan. She has great experience and many papers uh, in structural geology, uh, especially on tectonic metamorphic evolution of the high pressure and ultra high pressure belts, such as Sulu and uh, Davishan. Today, she will share her new evidence on coisite bearing ectogites from uh, central Sulu, Sulu belt. As you know, Dabi and Sulu belt uh, is uh, one of the most famous and very well studied uh, Triassic ultra high pressure belt in the world. And is characterized by the common existence of uh, very well preserved uh, coisite and uh, more rarely diamond bearing ectogites. The title of the presentation is Adding Time to the PT History of Deeply Subducted Intergranular Coisite Bearing Ectogite at Yang Kao Bay, Central Sulu Belt, China. I would like to invite Mr. Uh, Mrs. Wang to make her presentation. The stage is yours, uh, Mrs. Wang. Thank you. Thank you very much, Osman, for your introduction and invitation. It's, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, actually, I have a special meeting to talk about the UHP rocks here because uh, Professor O.K., he is uh, the pioneer to study ultra high pressure rocks and find coalside endowment with his Chinese colleagues in Dabeishan. So I read their papers when I was in PhD stage. Hello. So today I'm going to talk about some new technology to get the timing uh, constraint from the uh, PTT pass of the deeply subducted uh, intergranular coisite bearing ecologite in the Sulu belt. And this rock is difficult, it's no, no way to get the age uh, by the conventional geochronology method. So here is the outline. Uh, we'll start with background, then introduce a method, and then uh, show you the results and give some discussion and conclusion. So first, let's look at the scientific problems we're gonna propose. Um, the background is we all know the temporal evolution rule of deformation, metamorphism, and melt fluid history of deeply subducted continental crust has a great significance to understanding the organic physical chemical process. So it's a hot and frontier topic for many years. Uh, to constrain the risk of burial and estimation of UHP metamorphic rocks, it is essential to obtain the robust. PT and T time information, which related to both of the prograde and retrograde evolution. Therefore, it is necessary to select most deeply subducted continental slab to obtain the systematic PTT data under the extreme UHP metamorphism condition because most of the rock has already exper experienced a retrogression um, by overprinting. So it's difficult to get the complete picture. However, such information may be difficult to obtain from the most deeply buried UHP metamorphic terrains for two reasons. Because uh, we usually consider the continental crust is much drier compared to the oceanic crust subduction. So during the subduction, the continental crust subduction has much drier uh, fluid environment compared to the oceanic ones. So the deeply uh, subducted continental crust uh, will suffer from the fluid deficient condition, which limits the mineral growth and recrystallization during the late prograde and early retrograde evolution, because this is the driest environment. And also the generation of the fluid and all melt during exhumation facilities, retrogressive overprinting of the earlier history then will cover the earlier information of, of the metamorphic ages or metamorphic reactions. So, for age, uh, for age obtained, it will be difficult to get a zircon age because of this reason, because under this kind of condition, the zircon usually will show the incomplete recrystallization, like the ghost, uh, ghost texture. It shows the same similar shape with the core uh, zoning, but it's uh, incompletely re uh, recovered 
are uh, changed by the recrystallization, incomplete rec recrystallization, means they uh, crystallize in the solid state, or the zircon will only grow very narrow, narrow uh, metamorphic meth 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 <laughs> rings, which is difficult to use a traditional method to get the age data. And the second reason, the overprinting, we already talked about it. So this is the problem we're gonna encounter. And this is a PT pass um, um, estimated by our group, by uh, Dr. Xia in the Journal of Petrology in 2018 of the sample I'm gonna talk about today is a coiset echo jet from our study area, which has a PT max condition can reach to 5.5 GPA. So for the pressure range above three or four GPA, this zone is all fluid deficient zone. Therefore, it's very difficult to get zircon age. So let's look at a little bit of introduction of the W pseudo belt. Uh, we know that it is one of the largest UHP orogenic belt extended from the central China to the eastern of China. This is W Shan, this is the pseudo belt, and they are offset by a later Tanlu fault. And they all have a high pressure zone and, uh, and uh, ultra high pressure zone. Our sample is within the ultra high pressure zone of Sulu Belt in the central Sulu Belt by the Yangkou Bay and near Qingdao, Qingdao city, you know, where the Qingdao beer is very famous for. <laughs> so um, this belt is produced by the Yangtze Kraton subducted beneath the North China Kraton in the Mesorock time and uh, uh, experienced a continental continental collision. The typical age for the protolith age of these UHP rocks are 820 to 780 during the Rohingya break off and rifting, and then subducted and, and exhumed to the surface of the Earth and experienced the UHP metamorphic ages within 240 to 228 billion years. That's already been tested by many scientists in China and in the world. Um, so why we choose a sample from Yanko? It is very, because it's very special. Why special? First, it is the deepest subduction of the Sulu belt where the rock get exposed. And in 2000, in year 2000, where Yekai's nature paper reported this uh, exolution from the garnet or majorite of eclogite in, in Yanko, it was the deepest subduction of continental crust ever reported at that time. And also is deepest uh, subducted in the pseudo belt. So um, uh, there might be some multiple interpretation by the exolution, but our groups work for the direct PT estimation by phase equilibrium modeling also um, prove that this uh, pressure can be at least larger than 5.5 GPA, which is roughly equivalent to the 180 kilometers subduction depth. So that's uh, the sample we talked about. We have to choose the most deeply subducted. The second is, it is also the first location and also the unique location where the intergranular coicide preserved within the orogenic echogite. We all know that coicide is a UHP in index mineral and it, its preservation can only prove that locally it's a dry environment. So, so it's usually be preserved in, as an inclusion in the eclogite, but this is only one case that it preserved along the green boundaries of anthracite, different anthracite and the garnet greens. Sorry, the garnet is offset when I move this picture. This is a picture I reported in 2018 GMG paper. So with this integral coincide, we can tell that during the exhumation, this coincide bearing eclogite it was under a very dry fluid environment. This is what it, it can tell us. And also this area, this is the detailed map we have done in this area. And it locally preserved the eclogite preserve the evidence of gabbro eclogite fishes to, uh, from gabbro to eclogite fishes transformation in this outcrop. It's also partly because of it's a dry environment. And through our mapping, we find that these coincide bearing eclogite actually are uh, preserved within the F1, the earliest acyclinal um, intrafolial rootless fold. Um, so I will explain you 
uh, later. And because this area is very famous, so many people is trying to get the ages of this uh, eclogite in this area. They choose a sample from Metagabrol. They choose a sample from the uh, eclogite, coarse eclogite, fungite bearing coarse eclogite, and humbland bearing eclogite. But all these methods all failed. All these temp attempts failed to, de to date the thin metamorphic overgrowth rim of the zircon because of this, the reason I have already explained before. So is it really that dry? It seems not because uh, our groups um, in the past 10 years, we have worked in extensively of the fluid melt uh, evolution history in this area. We find two kilometers away, there's the megmatite of eclogite get partially melted during exhumation. Uh, only two kilometers away from this outcrop. And from exactly this outcrop, this coicide bearing eclogite, we can identify five types of hydrophilic mineral, which is a barite. It crystallizes within this rock and recording multiple stage of fluid events during the late prograde to metamorphism exhumation stages. So that means fluid and melt is not completely away from this rock. So how do we solve this problem? We have, uh, before this uh, geochronological work, we have done very extensive metamorphic studies of uh, three uh, representative eclogite samples in this area, including a planet, uh, including a coastside bearing eclogite, fungite bearing eclogite, and the coarse eclogite. So we have already established the metamorphic events recorded by these eclogites. One of them is very interesting is in the, in uh, coal site bearing and fungite bearing eclogite, we find uh, two special zones. This eclogite zone is, it shows very low water activity because uh, the intergranular coal site can still be preserved. But in between, there are some fungite plus pores, uh, vein lines indicate very high uh, water activity uh, within the eclogite. And through the geobarometry, we can tell that it's crystallized and uh, the ultra high pressure are close to 4 GPA. So from the eclogite metamorphic history, we can tell there are at least the three stage of the metamorphism going on in this rock. Because in the late stage of the exhumation, we can still uh, observe some fungite breakdown melting within the coarse eclogite in C21, very minor uh, behavior but at least we can set up this sequence from prograde to early exhumation and to the late exhumation. So for the PT, we have already get it out to get a very good result. What about the T, small t, timing? Things, the difficulty we uh, explained before, it looks like we need some new technology. So we choose to collaborate with the people from University of California, Santa Barbara, they have uh, developed some new method in their lab. It's called a single shot. Uh, simply we call it SSLASS. It's a single shot laser ablation, split stream SCP geochronology chemistry. They are still SCP mass machine, a uh, higher precision. But with their method, they can get the uranium lead age of the zircon uh, based on its youngest metamorphic age and also get the trace elements uh, at the same time on the same brain. So this is a picture I take when I was do doing lab work there. This is their lab um, responsible person, Dr. Andrew Clark. He's an expert of metamorphic and geochronology uh, a person working on the Western Nice region. And he developed this method. And this is uh, one of our colleagues um, sent from the University of Maryland. We work together day and night several days to date on a few samples in this outcrop. So what's special for this method? First, sample pre uh, preparation should be different because we know for a zircon uh, uranium net uh, analysis, we have to um, mount the zircon and then cut at least one third of it and then polish it and then drill the hole and get the age information. But for this method, this zircon shouldn't, shouldn't do any 
polishing any cutting. It, you have to make sure the surface is totally exposed. And this is, these are the sample we have made by ourselves in the lab. So we can see this under the CL image and SEM is pretty, uh, pretty uh, not flat because the surf, only part of the surface you can see from the flat area, but these are the other planes of the zircon greens. And not all of them are flat. That means we have to do a lot of analysis and only choose a good uh, age data. So the method, what's special of the method based on the preparation surface? First, we only date the zircon surface. So we have impulse ablation directly from the surface with multiple shots. And every shot, we only drill very shallow depths, 100 nanometer. And every single shot, the age can be uh, identified and separated. Therefore, we can obtain very narrow zircon rim age based on different shots until we see the age start to change. And we saw we can also obtain the solid recrystallization part of zircon because it's very narrow and it can usually it developed from the rim to the interior. So if we get the surface age, then we get the youngest metamorphic age of the zircon that's recorded in this rock. So here is a model. Every in, Every pulse we only drill 100 nanometer. Usually we get, we usually we can get 10 pulse of the shot, and every shot have several seconds in between. So we can get ages of every shot, every shot until they their age become older and older and jump to the older maybe protolus age or a mixture age of the rim and uh, the core. And this is the profile of the age and trace element profile. So you can also see the trend is changing with different shots. By this method, if we compare with the conventional uh, SCP mass and shrimp or thins, we can tell that for ablation and spot size, they're almost the same. But for the analytical time of one zircon grain, uh, other methods only one time means you drill a hole, then it's forever. But very often you get to the mixture age because it can be a mixed, because the metamorphic rim are not homogeneous. So it, it very often you can get a mixture between the rim and the core. That's why sometimes you cannot use the age by this uh, conventional method. And you never know when is the mixture. But with this method, we, ha we can have uh, 10 episodes with interval and every episode is uh, uh, distinguishable. And the depth, of course, this is the shallowest. So with 100 nanometer per, per uh, shots, we get 10 and we can only we can we can only drill one micrometer. That allows us to get get the age from the very narrow rim of these uh, zircons. So here is our sample under FEM. It's not so flat, so we drill the three areas, try to get the best age. Uh, and this is the example to show why it's reasonable because after we get 10 shots, suddenly the, the, the information jumped to a, di a different level of the age so that we know, okay, now we drill to a different layer of the zircon. Then we can just choose this zone to get the age. And also the meanwhile, we can get the in-situ uh, contemporary uh, RE data of the zircon and can separate the, the core and the rim data. So after we mastered this technique, how do we use for our research based on the problems we proposed before? So we're gonna use integrated study, start from the structure in the field. This is the field sketches we published in 2010 Journal of Structural Theology paper, and the coincide bearing echojet sample are taken from here, the F1 fold, roughly fold, and they are surrounded and cemented by some by the soft uh, mac, uh, coarse rich mica schist. So the coincide sample are usually taken from the F1 fold nodes, closure of the echojet folds, and then the coarse rich uh, coarse echojet, which means the integrated coincide start to gradually all change into course are usually taken from the sample of the echojet limb. So F1, F2, they are progressive deformation. 
So we interpreted is uh, developed before the peak or early estimation in the published papers. Based on this analysis, we start to choose a sample from separately from the nose and limb at different location, and then combined with petrography, we use a selective sample to do the geochronology. And the geochronology sample uh, test, we're going to we use the conventional method combined with the depth profile method. In the end, try to establish the PTT path and reveal the melt fluid evolution of the most deeply subducted continental crust in the Yonko Bay pseudo belt. <clears throat> so here is the petrology features. First, start with coisite eclogite. The intergranular coisite are very well, very well um, preserved along the green boundaries of garnet and anthracite. Uh, it, pre it preserved the most of the intergranular coisite in this area. And this eclogite usually is uh, <clears throat> bimineralic eclogite, which means mostly composed of garnet and anthracite. There's no other hydrous mineral like fungite. And very few symplectite later stage retrogression or partial melting evidences are found in this sample. And within the garnet, they preserve abundant <clears throat> inclusions, which represent the prograde stage crystallization when the garnet was grown. And deformation it within F1 rootless bone node. And fluid, no obvious. So we interpreted this rock record, the M1, from prograde to UHT metamorphic stage metamorphism. If we move, if we cut a thin section from the F2, the rim part, which is still part of the closure fold, <clears throat> this is the thin section. We can see it's kind of start to show some layer structure. And if we choose this area and the thin section, we can find the phenomenon I talked about before. Uh, in this zone is uh, intergranular coisite bearing eclogite has a tiny bit of small grains of fungite. Uh, sorry, uh, fungite, which indicate it's a low fluid activity zone. But in some certain uh, linear uh, planar area, you can see the much bigger grain of uh, fungite plus quartz, which indicate this is crystallized in the high fluid activity environment. So this is an enlarged picture where it shows that the fungite has much bigger uh, grain size compared to the eclogite zone. So, and if we look closer to the fungite bearing eclogite, this fungite is usually less than 5%. And uh, you can see it's less integrated coisite preserved compared to the bimineralic eclogite. And deformation still no obvious SPO and sub garnet still preserve some uh, inclusions. That means no crystallization is completed yet. And for the fluid activity, it's only locally preserved. So it's not 3D connected. So this is different structural location. And then when we move to, to this, uh, uh, just a little bit, just one meter away, they start have the transformation from coisite eclogite to the coarse eclogite. So we, well, after we take the sample of the coarse eclogite, this is the thin section scan, and this is under the uh, microscope. You can, you can tell these uh, fungite plus manners coarse veinlets start to be connected in the 3D dimension. So the shear sense of the eclogite also gets stronger. And the thin section, you can, you can see the fungite percentage is rising up. It's much more than the previous two rock types. And coarse is more, and symplectite start to appear. And there's no intergranular coisite preserved in this rock anymore. And deformation of the garnet and anthracite is also different. They start to recrystallize. You will see the garnet start to be free of the inclusions and anthracite grains become much smaller. So for fluid part, that means that the retrogression start to be active in this stage. Therefore, we interpreted this rock start record M2s, indicating early exhumation process of coisite to coarse eclogite fishes transfer. 
Then what about their, the rock surrounding them? The cool stretch mecca schist. Um, it composed by quartz, a lot of quartz, fungite, garnet, kyanite, and albite, and minor rutio and epidote. Uh, For deformation, it, because the rock itself is weaker, so it has a relative higher water activity. And uh, the garnet still shows some euhedral and uh, usually free of uh, uh, inclusions, but preserve the multi solid phase, phase inclusions indicating partial melting. So I will show you some pictures. These are the uh, backscatter image under the SEM and APMA. We, uh, from this sample, we can see the intergranular K feldspar plus quartz uh, intergranular and fungite have in situ breaking down reaction. And there are lots of uh, multi-solid phase inclusions within the garnet. It, it, these are usually the melting products after the fungite breakdown. So this sample definitely shows very um, strong evidence for the partial melting going on in, in this uh, sample. It's just in-situ partial melting and the local sun pocket as a green boundary, and also the migration of these uh, local sun to the triple junction of the green boundary. But no matter how, this is still low grade and small scale partial melting. And we can use PT uh, estimation to get its uh, PT range. So after this information gets clear, we start to choose a re representative three sample, three sample types to get the geochronology. We choose coisite eclogite, we choose coarse eclogite and the mica schist. We use conventional method and depth profile together. So these are the CL images of the conventional zircon target samples. I'm going to show you the features one by one. This is a coisite eclogite, conventional CL image. Uh, from the core, we can see they are kind of blurred uh, oscillatory zoning, uh, which indicates they are inherited magmatic zircon. But for, from the rim, as we showed before, it shows a kind of uh, uh, recrystallization, but it's not complete. So this is usually means the this zircon is crystallized in the solid state. That means a very few liquid is participated. So it shows the ghost texture. For coarse enclogite, they are kind of different. Actually, apart from the same uh, stage one, the brighter uh, zone, but also they have a darker darker zone of the a narrow metamorphic rim. So that means there are some other uh, later metamorphic events overprinted on the top. For mecha schist, the zircon rim is even thinner, usually only a few um, micrometer, but the core are still very well preserved. So to compare, we still did the conventional method, uh, did the conventional uh, L LASP mass analysis because when we show these cell images to the UC uh, Santa Barbara lab, they don't believe they cannot produce the age. So they still suggest to do the conventional method. But in the end, look what we get. Coisite eclogite, coarse eclogite, we get upper intersection, no problem. But lower intersection has huge uh, error. And for mecha schist, we even don't have the lower intersection age. So there's no effective meta age can be obtained from them. But so after we decided to use the LA, uh, LASS method from coisite eclogite, we get a Tara Wasserberg concordial age of 250 with a smaller arrow and a weighted mean age 250, which is quite consistent. And for the coarse eclogite, we get uh, Tara Wasson burger age 228 and a weighted mean age 200, almost 28. That's an also very consistent. But for the mica schist, uh, because we choose two samples, one has garnet, one doesn't have garnet. So they have shown different uh, youngest metamorphic age recorded by the zircon. One of them is about 225, which is very normal. Um, Eclogite fishes to amphibolite fishes transformation metamorphic age recorded in other pseudo belt in other part of the W pseudo belt. And another sample of mecha schist, we get a pretty young age of 213. 
So these are the list of the ages. So from the coastal echojet, coastal echojet, and mica schist, the depth profile method we recorded from these rock types show the youngest metamorphic age they recorded is ranging from very old to much younger. So there is this trend. And for certain uh, REE distribution, we can also see the core and the rim are different. And these are quite classical metamorphic rim and show that they the, garnet, the zircon is crystallized in the garnet stability field crystallization. So based on these results, what we can get, what information we can get. If we summarize all the metamorphism deformation and uh, melt fluid relationship, we summarize in this table, these three rock types from different structural location, and they show different uh, petrography features representing different stage of metamorphism and fluid activities getting strengthened. Therefore, we based, uh, combined with our previous study, we know that this integrated coesite was protected from fluid infiltration due to string localization around the host intrafolio folds. Uh, well, coarse echojet and coarse rich fungite schist was uh, rich grass to due, due to the generation of an integral fluid during early exhumation. For de detail, you can read uh, my GMG paper in 2018. So based on this information, we interpret this age, 250, uh, is the timing of prograde barrier, which is close to the peak metamorphism. Wherever the, these ages, recorded by coarse echojet and coarse rich fungi schist record the timing of exhumation from coesite to coarse uh, transformation stability field. So that's pretty good sequence. And based on the age information, we can combine them and link them with the metamorphism. We can, the metamorphic reaction we can observe under the same section, 250 barrier and two, uh, 240 to 228, we can see this uh, intergranular fluid start to trans uh, migrate and precipitate during the migration is under UHP condition. And then it's a retrogress to echlogite, post echlogite fishes and uh, experienced the fungite breakdown in situ partial melting. So that's the age recorded by the mica schist. And based on this uh, age, these two age, we know the PT range from 228. We know the PT from the fungite breakdown. Therefore, we can uh, estimate the exhumation rate is about six millimeter per year. So if we establish the framework, this is the age framework. The upper part is the established by a Chinese colleague from Beijing who did carried out from the UHP dolomitic marble in the other location of Sulu belt. And we can pretty pretty fitting very well our data into this framework. And, but the difference is we can determine that under 250 million years old, this coesite eclogite already reached to the ultra high pressure metamorphic depths, let's say at least 100 kilometers down. These are the framework established by other people. So, and also based on the uh, paleo map, map uh, use condition, uh, traditionally people think at the 240, the young craton and North China craton is still separated. But with our new data, we can be very sure that at 200 million years ago, North China craton and young craton should be already welded together. So this is the kind of new recognition. So our conclusion for the work is we established the time framework from subduction to early exhumation and late exhumation. And this is the uh, burial age and retrogression age is similar to other terrains of Sulu belt. So adjusting the similar rates of burial and exhumation of UHP units within the same origin. And the significance of this work is we should use integrated study of different perspective to help recover the complex thermal tiny evolution history of the deeply subducted continental crust. And this is the excellent example, apply the new technology, studying the time spatial evolution uh, uh, of fluid 
melt directly from deeply subducted continental crust. I think this important approach will be also helpful to constrain the geochronology framework of other metamorphic rocks that under the fluid absent background in the world. It doesn't have to be in UHP, but any rocks that has narrow uh, metamorphic rim or um, uh, solid uh, experience, solid recrystallization is very helpful. So this is my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, presentation. I think uh, everybody needs such a precise and ultra high technology machine because everybody has some zircons with very uh, uh, thin outermost rim to be dated, you know. <laughs> uh, I think we have uh, almost five minutes. We can get questions now. Is there any, any question? Uh, we have a question. One question. From from chat. chat uh, sorry. Can you see this one or I can also read it? Uh, do you need the, the, the share the screen? Chat. Can you open chat file? Oh, yes. I would like to Thank stay. You. Thank say you for it. your comments, <laughs> friends. The second one, I would like to say it has been an absolute pleasure to listen to this perfect presentation and thank you. Uh, another question? I think, I don't know. Have you seen any no. question? No. Maybe I can ask a question. Yeah. Uh, we see that your peak PT conditions is above the diamond graphite uh, curve, uh, ultra high pressure conditions. Did you find yeah. any uh, fresh diamond or not? Uh, we know that in, uh, in Sulu Dhabi uh, belt, uh, coisite is really very well preserved. Yeah, that's a very, very good common, question. But diamond is oh, diamond. extremely rare, I think. Yeah, yeah it's extremely diamond. rare for um, diamond because uh, I think OK, Professor OK uh, worked with uh, uh, Professor Xu in Dabi Shan. Uh -huh. They only find one yes. or two grains. Uh, probably it's because uh -huh. of the process. The material is lack of carbon. Uh, so it's not like a mm -hmm. mm, uh, Kazakhstan, right? Kazakhstan and in Russia, they have a lot of diamonds yes, because yes. Uh, they have a lot of carbon, but we don't have it. So uh -huh. maybe that's the reason. Mm -hmm. Another reason is I'm not a diamond expert. Maybe they disappear when I do the sample preparation. <laughs> it needs to be very carefully sample preparation. Yeah, uh, yes. But nobody has found until today in Sulu Belt, huh? uh, only oh, Dabisha region. Uh, Sulu Belt, yes. Yes, one Sulu case. Sulu also exists, diamond, you mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, one case in the southern part of Sulu. Sulu Belt, thank you. Mm, is welcome. there any question or not? No. Uh, no, I have one great chance. May I, may I ask my questions? Yes, uh, yes, we have a question. Okay, thank you very very much for this nice presentation. Really, it is very good for the, especially for those who want to work with the zircon. Just I wonder about the what is the small size of the spot during the analysis and what is the accuracy for this uh, moment? if it is more than, let's say about one micron, and what is the accuracy results? The spot size we decide to use is about 35 micron. 35? Uh, so yes, 35. You can also change it according to your needs because the, the, the size, the area is not important. The depth is important. And also it depends on how homogeneously of your surface layer is, is distributed uh, surrounding the the surface of the zircon. So usually we just use uh, the average 35. But the one thing you need to be noticed is uh, if you do 40 um, zircon, probably you only get four or five good data because, because you do this very randomly. So maybe only four or five are exactly covering the complete area of the 
metamorphic thin rim. Okay, thank you very much. I think You're welcome. One more question. Uh, yeah. Jamal Gönceoğlu. Can we open uh, his uh, microphone? Cemal Hocam, mikrofonunuzu ve sesinizi açar mısınız? Açtım sanıyorum, evet. Um, thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. Um, I wonder whether you have checked uh, that new methods by abrading, abrading the outermost part of your zircons, uh, whether uh, what you have measured, that, that change in the uh, composition is also recorded in that in these abraded chemically or, or physically abraded uh, zircon grains. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, when we do the age dating, we also can get the trace element uh, data at the same time on the exactly the same piece. So you can observe how they change and plot them. And so all, all our metamorphic uh, data age, we also get the trace element plot. They are consistent. So they are metamorphic ring, not the, you know, the protolith magmatic circle. Again, out of 100 uh, spots, maybe we can only get uh, five or six good data, but that's enough. Good data, good quality data is better than uh, many bad data. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I think, I think uh, there is no more question, uh, Lou. Yes. I'd like to thank you for joining us for the Geological Society meeting. Thank you I for wish the invitation. We, we could be together face to face in Turkey, but I hope the pandemic will, will be over and we will see each other again. And great to the team. And uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I see thank Tim Kuski had a question make a recommendation to use a new technique in Turkey. Um, I think there must be some ways. Oh, he's here. So for example, I think the, um, for the, because Turkey has so many amphilites in the accretional prism, you have mafic rocks, which goes down at different depths and then come up. Uh, so maybe some of them not recording enough um, metamorphic rim. If it's narrow, too narrow, maybe we can use this method. But in fact, uh, the, the zircons in the metamorphic rocks, which formed during the intraoceanic subduction, actually, because of the fluids, there is no overgrow overgrowth of uh, the, uh, along the rim of the zircons, but we have a mm -hmm. very patchy and cloudy uh, appearance of zircons. So everything is reset actually, instead of having a, having a new ring around because if of the fluids. Reset, then there's no need to use this method. This is only for the really difficult rocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, extreme, extreme conditions. Yeah. Mm. Uh, once okay. again, we want to thank uh, Mrs. Wang uh, for accepting our invitation, and we hope to see her again in Turkey. I hope so too. Yeah. Bye -bye. Maybe see you next year. Bye bye. Okay, bye bye. <laughs>